You're listening to Sent, a sermon series that walks through the Gospel of John, focusing on John's call for us to live sent, being a people fashioned in the image of God. For more information about First Baptist Startville, you can visit www.fbcstartville.com. You know, if you were here last week, that was a that was a lot of fun. Having so many people here, we had to put chairs out. We had to we had new members inducted into the choir last week. I mean, it was incredible. We heard tell too that there were about uh, well preliminary reports say 30 people in the cove listening to the service. But of course, I'm a Baptist preacher. It was at least 100 people listening uh, back behind us. But that was really a lot of fun. Realistically, if we were to look back on that time and that day in the history of our church, we could honestly say that we had people hanging out of the windows here. I mean, there was just a a whole group of people here, and having a crowd at a church is always fun for the preacher. It's always fun for the staff. It's always fun for the church. But we met as a staff afterwards, and we took time to remember Deuteronomy 8, as well as we confessed together as a staff Psalm 127.1 that says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. And we're so overwhelmed and and thankful just from a a staff perspective as well as from a church perspective, if we're honest. We are so thankful for last week, and, and we are really hopeful and asking our Lord to trust us for more. And you say, well, what's the more that we're asking? We're asking the Lord for more opportunity to tell the story of God's redeeming love. We want to tell the gospel to as many people as possible, as clearly as possible, and as effectively as possible. Now, see, we all want the crowds to come, but here's my prayer. Here's our prayer. I pray that we would more, instead of wanting a crowd to come to us, we would be more willing to go to them than they are to come to us. In other words, it's one thing to have a come-and-see mentality as a church. It's another thing for us to have a go-and-tell mentality. And the go-and-tell mentality is what separates our Christian confession from any other thing in the world. It's not come-and-see so much as it is go-and-tell. Now, there is aspects, of course, where there's a come-and-see. This is what Paul uh, labors in churches and calls churches to come together. But more than that, there is a go-and-tell mentality. And this whole series is designed to send you to them. And you're going to them. And by the way, the them is whoever is not a believer. The them is a demonstration of the faithfulness of the mission that God has given us. And what's that mission? It's a mission that He's given us to tell the world a message of hope. And that's the more that we're praying for. And so you see, all of these instances where we can have in our mind this, well, well, I can't go, are all turned into, I'm called to go. Regardless of what you feel, there's some days that I don't feel like doing certain things, but that's really not what we're talking about. We're not talking about feelings. We're talking about marching orders from our Lord and Savior, the risen Lord, Jesus Christ. He has told us and given us Matthew 28, not just for me, not just for the staff. It's for us to go and make disciples. And so all of those instances where maybe you've had, oh, I can't go because, I want you to take that and turn it into, I'm called to go, because this is what you're called to do. I like the way that Paul says this to the Roman church. He says this in Romans 10. Listen to the language. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? Now, as it's written, Paul says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And so there's some of you like, aha, see, that right there, that's where I've got you. Uh, I'm not called to preach. Well, listen, yes, you are. You are called to preach. You you may not be called to do what I do here where I take the ingredients of God's Word through diligent study and I prepare 
uh, the ingredients and put it in a format like this, an edible format where we can look at one passage of Scripture and we can all come together and feast on the Word. You may not have the science, you may not have studied the science called homiletics, you may not even, but then again, maybe some of you are called to that. Maybe there's some within the sound of my voice that you are called to this specific type of preaching. But you are a preacher. The word here that Paul uses is keruso, keruso, and that word means proclaim. And so, when we preach, we proclaim or we herald a message. We are those who stand on the streets or in our businesses, wherever we are, and and we tell this story. Did you hear about this? Have you heard about this? Can you believe that this happened? Every time we engage in that type of activity, we are doing what the Bible calls proclaiming. Think about it. Just at uh, every sporting event that Mississippi State has, at every sporting event that you attend, there's an announcer. You know what that announcer is doing? They are making sure that you are understanding what just happened. They're simply telling you what happened. And when we tell the story, when we have those uh, can you believe that this happened kind of moments, the Bible calls that carousoing or preaching or proclaiming. And so we say, can you believe that this happened? We say, have you heard the news? We're preaching. Now, I want to ask you a question, Christian. Do you believe that we have a story worth telling? What is it? And how will you tell it? And so my job every week is to come and tell you the story so that you can tell the story. It's not so that you'll be impressed by, oh, my goodness, I can't believe he got that out of that passage, or my goodness, did you hear his voice and how? It's not all of that. It's not any of that stuff. It's just simply so that I can give you means necessary for you to tell the story to someone else. I want to preach so that you'll leave here saying, not, not so you'll leave here saying, man, what a great sermon. But I want you to leave here saying, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the Scripture and showed us Jesus? And you carry the embers of that burning heart with you as you go. And so, like any good news, it's too good to be kept to yourself. And so, what is that story? Listen to it. There is a God who sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will never perish but have everlasting life. And you get to tell that story. No matter where you are, if you're a dentist here this morning, if you're a lawyer here this morning, if you're a professor here this morning, if you're a student here this morning, if you're a preacher here this morning, you get to tell that. You know, I don't just tell this story on Sundays. It'd be a shame if the only time I ever told this story was on Sundays. That doesn't seem like good news. It's sometimes good news. No, this is all the time good news. It's not so much just a simple story that we tell. It's a a story that forms the way that we live our lives. And so you get the privilege, and I hope that you understand it. It is a privilege. You get the God-given privilege to tell the good news of God's salvation through His Son or in His Son, Jesus Christ. So go ahead and take your Bible. Let's, let me show you this. John 18. John 18. We'll focus today on verse 33 through 40, and we're ending the… Uh, we're, we're near ending these, uh, our series, Sent, and today we have this special occasion after Easter to, to look at the trial of Jesus. And some of you are saying, well, you really missed it, you know? Why, why didn't we do this last week when it was really Easter? Why didn't we look at this last week? But I'm sort of glad that it, it sort of panned out this way because we get to keep telling the story after Easter. And think about this. Think about this. There have been people gathering for nearly 2,000 years telling the same story. 
Think about the, the benefit that we have of being a multi-generational church called First Baptist Church. You get to look around, and you get to see people that are your same age. You get to see people that are uh, older than you. Some of you get to do that. Some of you the oldest in the room. You get to see people who are younger than you. All of us together, you know, the, the people that are older than you, think about how long they've been coming to something like this and rehearsing this story so that they can go and tell that story. Every time we have staff chapel in the old chapel, I think about how many, who used to sit in those pews. For 150 plus years, the saints called First Baptist Starkville have been seated in a place rehearsing the story one time a week. That's what it is. You're rehearsing the story. You're just like the rest of the church. You're gathering together just like we've been doing for almost 2,000 years on the first day of the week. And here we are. We're telling this story because it doesn't get old. It's a living story. But this section that we're looking at today in our Bible, it's a little bit different. If you look at John 18, you'll see our word sent at verse 24. Look at it. Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So there's our word that we've been tracing through John, this word sent. And that's a little bit different use for the way that we've seen John use sent or the way that I've shown you how John has used this word sent. But really, in that different usage, we have the whole message. Listen to it. Listen. He was sent not only for us, but because of us. He was sent not only for us, but because of us. We are guilty of the death of Jesus. And because of the death of Jesus, we're saved. That's the whole reason we have in verse 38 through 40 this story of Barabbas. We are guilty of the death of Jesus, and because of the death of Jesus, we're saved. So here's what I want us to do. I want you to put these two concepts together. Look at chapter 18 and verse 24, where he's, uh, Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, and then put together for our reading today at verse 37. Look at what Jesus says. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. He was sent for us and because of us. He was sent for us and because of us. He has come to save the guilty. And the way that he saves the guilty is through the cross. Let's read the Bible. Look at verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. I want you to consider something just for a minute. Think about this. And it's okay for us to say this. I don't know how you view how the Bible was written, 
But really, the key phrase that we have about describing how the Bible was written, the key phrase is the word inspiration. That is, men were moved by the power of the Holy Spirit to tell the story. Think about this. For example, there's a whole generation that's, that's dying, and that's the greatest generation they've been called, War, World War II. There's all these documentaries that have uh, veterans telling the story of events that happened 80-plus years ago. And now you've got another generation that's dying, my dad's generation, who was in Vietnam. And right now, my dad gets calls all the time from people that want him, being with the 173rd Airborne Brigade, to tell the story of Doc Toe, to tell the story of, of Hill 875 and Hill 823, Hamburger Hill, and all these other stories that my dad was a part of these battles. My dad is near, you know, 50 plus years nearly, he is 50 years removed from some of these events, and they happen like they were yesterday. Think about this. We are nearly 2,000 years removed from the events of the life of Jesus, but we keep telling the story. John is writing this gospel decades after the life of Jesus, but that's okay. Because to him, it's just like they happened yesterday. Remember, he's not in some corner writing, okay, Jesus had fish for breakfast, and then he had to go talk to a woman, and then the woman said, how dare you talk to me? You know, that didn't happen. That's not the way that inspiration occurs. They're telling this story, and what are we doing here? Again, we're gathering together to rehearse this story, doing the same thing that Christians have been doing. And so Jesus, or excuse me, John is telling the story when he writes this. John's the last gospel because historically he wrote his gospel after all the rest of them did. And he's telling the story. And we keep telling the story today. Because the centerpiece of our story is Jesus on the cross. And here's what I want us to to understand from this passage. I want to tell you three truths about preaching the cross. And listen, this is not just for those who are homileticians in the room. You say, I didn't even know that I was that. Well, if you have a call to preach, that's what I mean. You have a call to do something like what I'm doing here. I'm talking to everyone in the room that's charged with the Great Commission to go and tell. When I was over in Jerusalem, I've told this story before, I went to the tomb of Jesus. I saw the tomb of Jesus was empty. There was an old British Baptist there, old man that couldn't even stand up straight. And he said, you came all the way across the pond just to see that the tomb is empty. And now that you've seen, go and tell. That's what you're called to do. So I want to give you three truths about preaching the cross. Because you're a preacher, you're a proclaimer, you're an announcer. It's just a matter of when you tell it, not if you tell it. And it's a matter of where you tell it and how you tell it. And so in this exchange with Pilate and Jesus, we have the message that we're called to tell. So here's the first point. Write this down. The way to the kingdom is the way of the cross. This is the first peg of us telling the story. The way to the kingdom is the way of the cross. So look at what we have here in the Bible. Jesus, he's been arrested. He's been bound. He's been struck. He is in total control. You see, John's telling us the truth that God turned the world upside down through the sun hanging on the cross. God has reoriented all of time and space to Jesus hanging on a cross. You see, Jesus, he's not the victim here. The cross was not an accident. Jesus, he's not a rebel leading a rebellion. He's a king ushering in a different kind of kingdom. It's a kingdom of new creation. Listen to this, where the old is passing away violently. And the new is coming gloriously. You see, in his kingdom, the way up is down. In his kingdom, the way to be wise is by taking on patterns of living that the world says is out of step with reality and foolish. In his kingdom, the weak ones are the strong ones. In his kingdom, In order to find your life, he says you have to lose it. 
And in his kingdom, remember this, you must count any gain that you have as loss compared with knowing Jesus and his cross. You see what he says here to Pilate? He says, my kingdom is not of this world, and the way to the kingdom is the way of the cross. Now, he has a kingdom. His kingdom is just like, is, is, except his kingdom is not like anything the world has ever seen or known. And remember this, through the cross, he reorients all of hope towards himself. That's what he's doing. This magnificent, mighty Savior. This for us is salvation for us who believe, and we'll get, on, we'll get there in just a minute. But for everyone else, Paul says, it's foolishness. This is why he determined to the Corinthian church that was all filled with all types of educated people and people that thought that they knew better. Paul said, you know, I could impress you right now with all of my rhetoric, but I determined to know nothing amongst you except Christ and Him crucified. Why is that? Because in the cross of Christ, in the cross of Christ, He reorients all of hope towards Himself. And you know what He he then does? He then gives the kingdom to those who will follow after Him. And remember this, the only way to follow Him is by dying to yourself taking up your cross. Remember who it is that today is calling you to follow him. He's a Jesus with nail-scarred hands, with a side that has been pierced. It's no wonder that he appeared in the latter chapters of this book of John with the marks of crucifixion still upon him. Why is that? Because he wants us to always remember that the way to come after him is the way of the cross. And that leads us to make this second point of what we know about telling the story. Number two, the kingdom belongs to the crucified ones. The kingdom belongs to the crucified ones. Jesus says, look at what he says at verse 37, this is the reason that I have come into the world. This is it. He comes into the world not just as a way to salvation, but as himself salvation. Oftentimes, I think we think about salvation, you know, it's just like Jesus wraps up a present and says, oh, he he comes to our birthday party, right? It's our our new birth party. We can make this as Christian, you know, Christian speech as we want. It's our our, uh, new birth birthday party, rebirth birthday party. And so, he gives us this gift, and then he stands in the corner, and he, now, unwrap that little Johnny. Oh, that's, aren't you so cute, smiling, whatever. That's not what he does. He doesn't give us salvation as if it's something that stands outside of himself. No, no, that's not salvation. Salvation is him pulling us in to himself. Remember this, and we need to hold tight to this. Salvation, listen to the way that we speak. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You get to know him. This is what's so amazing about this. I think it's in this passage here where later on there's this, there's this lady, Mary, who comes to the tomb, remember? And you remember this beautiful scene where after Jesus is raised, supposing him to be a gardener. I love the way the gospel writers tell the story. Supposing him to be a gardener. She says, Lord, where have they put my Lord? Sir, where have they put my Lord? And then he says, one word. Mary. He said it a lot better than that, but he says, Mary. And then she sees him because he knows her name. And she says, Rabboni, Rabbi, teacher, it's you. This is the beauty of our Christian confession is you get to have a personal intimate relationship with the Creator who knows everything about you, and He loves you anyway. Remember the story of the woman at the well? What was her testimony? Come see the one who told me everything I've ever done. What's on the other side of that? And He accepted me anyway. 
This is this personal relationship that we get to have. There's a, there's a phrase that the Bible uses constantly over and over again. I think it's Paul's favorite phrase. It's this phrase that refers to our relationship. It's, it's in him or in Christ. Even as we're going to look at our summer series in the School of Faith here, we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer. And it's no wonder that the Lord taught us to pray first, our Father. Because what's that do? It pulls us in to relate with a God who through Jesus Christ and Him taking on flesh without, listen to this, without ceasing to be what He was, He becomes what He was not. He pulls us in to His relationship. Our identity, because we're in Him, is forever, listen to the way I speak, it's forever marked by Jesus who was crucified. And we cannot know Him except through a cross. And the other side of that, we are not known as His except through a cross. I want you to string, I'm going to string a couple of thoughts together for you that John has been showing us. I don't have time to take you there, otherwise we would, but if you're taking notes, just write down these references. I'll make sure uh, to say the references so that you can write them down and look at it. This golden thread that John has in his Bible to let us know this truth, you cannot know God except through a cross. Listen to this. John 3.14, John 3.14 Jesus says, as Moses was lifted up in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him, who, the one who was lifted up, may have eternal life. Then He says this in John 8, 28, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. Did you hear that? When you've lifted Him up, then you'll know that I am He. And then finally, in John 12, 32, listen to the way Jesus speaks. And when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. You hear what John's saying? He's saying this so that we'll understand it. The reason John's gospel, you know, you know why you like John's gospel better than Matthew? Don't tell Matthew or Mark or Luke, but you know the reason you like it? Because John had a unique perspective. And you know what his unique perspective was? If you think about historically, where was John? He was at the foot of the cross with Mary. We don't know if Peter ever saw the crucifixion. We don't know if Matthew ever saw the crucifixion. We do know that none of them saw it from the vantage point of John. And what's John telling us all through his gospel? He's telling us that you cannot know God apart from a cross. Now, think, think with me. How we know God, how we know God means a great deal in our discovery of what we know about Him. You see, he, as much as He's our personal Lord and Savior, don't think that that gives you a license to create a God in your own, of a, your own imagination. That's not what it means. Remember, you don't set the terms for your relationship. He does because He is who He is. He's the Lord. And so we don't have the right, not without consequence, to make a God in our own image. He's not a God of our imagination. He's a, listen to the way that we speak about Him. He is a crucified, risen, coming again Christ. Think about the vocabulary. All of that little phrase that we just say, a crucified, risen coming again Christ. All of that is because the Bible has taught us how to speak truth about who He is. Yes, He's a personal Lord and Savior. No, He's not your homeboy. No, He's not your best friend. He is a Lord that loves you, and a Lord that's ready to be loved by you. He is crucified because of sin. He came for us and was crucified because of us. And His crucifixion bears witness to the truth of the world. And what's the truth of the world? The way to be right with God is through the cross. 
You know, Paul says, think about this. Paul says, it's a way that Christians speak all after encountering and letting our minds be elevated to those thoughts of a, of a, of a, of a sent, crucified, risen, coming again Savior. All of those words that now are ours because God has given it to us through His Holy Word. Paul then, he says things like, he has been crucified with Christ. Now, was Paul ever crucified? Did he ever undergo crucifixion? Well, no. What's he talking about then? He is talking about our identity with the crucified one as the crucified ones. Remember, you're in him. This is why Paul says in Galatians 6, 14, he says, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a great way to stop, right? Amen, preacher. Preach it, preacher. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he keeps going. By which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now, that's a little bit different, isn't it? This is what he says again to the Romans, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. Our identity is marked by Jesus. We only know God through a cross. We only come to God by taking up our cross. And through our dying to self, we live. Our life is hid with Christ through crucifixion. He undergoes the grueling cross so that through, so that through His death, we can now have life. We now belong to a crucified, risen Savior. There's no other Jesus out there. There's not a Jesus that it looked like that he was crucified, but he really wasn't crucified. He really wasn't dead, but he sort of looked like this, this not a, that's not a true Jesus. And by faith, we've died with him. That is, we've come to realize that his death was in reality a death for us. And by faith, we will live with Him. That is, we realize that His resurrection one day is going to be our resurrection. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. The kingdom belongs to the crucified ones. The kingdom belongs to the crucified ones. It's, it's not those who are high and mighty, not those who are wise but to the crucified ones. What if when we come to moments like this where we, we have meetings with one another, what if we remembered, I've been crucified with Christ? You know, on the way to church this morning at the 8.30 service, uh, I turned down a little side street, and there was a gentleman walking on the side of the road, and I waved at him. And you know what he decided to do? He decided to wave back in a very unfriendly way, you know, with certain gestures that are very inappropriate. And you know, what I wanted to do is I want to, hey, roll down the window. Well, we don't do that anymore. Push the button and say, what? what? I've been crucified with Christ. That's my identity. What if... What if before we post on social media, we say, I have been crucified with Christ? What if before we really take to heart what someone comes and says to us and about us, what if before we get all upset and twisted up, what if instead we simply say, I have been crucified with Christ? There was once a story that Spurgeon used to tell. And this is not firsthand knowledge, obviously. Charles Spurgeon's been dead a long time. But uh, Spurgeon used to tell a story of, of someone who called a meeting with him and said that he had something about him that he knew that he needed to tell him. Spurgeon was in a tizzy. He thought, oh, my, what does he know? And then this gentleman came and, and told Spurgeon what he knew about him. And Spurgeon said a sigh of relief, wiped his brow, and said, oh, is that it? 
that's what you know? And said, dear brother, if you really knew who I was. That's what we, our testimony is. There is a God who knows everything there is to know about us. And he has decided to make an end of our sin through sending his son on the cross to die for us. And so now who are we? We are crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, as Paul says, Galatians, but Christ who lives through me. And that doesn't mean that we're just laissez-faire and get to do what we want. He says, the life that I now live, I get to live by faith in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Seniors and, and college students and those who are in high school and those who are c- considering a career path and You have all this pressure, right? All this pressure. Just If I don't make it, release yourself from the pressure and remember that you have been crucified with Christ. The worst thing imaginable has already happened to you, which means that the best thing imaginable is now yours through Him. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you won't go through life unfazed, unscathed, and without any heartache. But what it means is it gives you an anchor for your soul. And what's the anchor? I have been crucified with Christ. And this is ours to say, all because of Jesus. And and I just want to say, it sounds so strange, even as I'm saying it. It sounds strange. Because the world says, be your best, try your hardest. Conform to today's standards. Get on the right side of history. And Jesus says, you want to come to me? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and die. It's through losing yourself that you find yourself in Christ. You see, number three, and I don't even have time to flesh this out, but I at least want you to write it down. The kingdom that Christ is proclaiming, this kingdom is the truth of the world. Why did we have such a big crowd on Easter? Because people can't get enough of the of the story. Even if the rest of life is lived, whatever, people know that. Our society realizes all over the world that we need this story because this story is the true story of the world and the kingdom, this kingdom that Christ is proclaiming, it's the truth of the world. I want you to see this very quickly. Look at the way Jesus says this in verse 37, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Now, that's an interesting way to speak, isn't it? He says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. You would think that everyone listens to me who's truth, but he doesn't say that. He puts the emphasis on you listening. He puts the emphasis on your response. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice, he says. So the question, are you of the truth? You say, how do I know? Are you listening to his voice? I love the way the NIV translates this, and maybe some of you have an NIV. It says, everyone who is on this side of the truth listens to my voice. Everyone who is on this side of the truth listens to my voice. And listen to me, we have no way but being on this side of the cross of Jesus Christ. There is no denying that Jesus Christ died on a cross. There is no denying that. We as Christians diverge from historians, and we say we believe that the resurrection is a historical fact. That's still up for debate in somebody's mind, but we're on this side of the truth, this side of the truth that Christ has been crucified and that He is risen, that He is ascended, and He is coming. You see, on this side of the truth, there's hope on the other side of the truth. There's no hope. But with Jesus Christ, there's every hope. Just think about this just for a moment. Here is Jesus bound, beaten, fixing to undergo crucifixion, the most humiliating death. He's going to be stripped naked. He's going to be publicly shamed. Pilate and his banter is calling him the king of the Jews. In other words, this is the best the Jews have. Pilate is 
the most powerful man in the region, representing the most powerful empire that the world has ever seen at that time. And you know the one reason you remember Pilate's name? It's because of Jesus. And Jesus says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. I just want to close with one question for you today. Which side are you on? Are you on this side of truth, where there's hope, where there's acceptance? Or are you on that other side of truth where there's denial? You can't remove the cross. You can only be moved by the cross. And the truth of the, wor- of the truth of the world is that there is a God in heaven who sent His Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes in Him would never perish, but have everlasting life. And that, my dear friends, is the truth of our message. Now, don't you think that's worth telling somebody? It's too good to keep to yourself. You say, well, who am I going to tell? Whoever. You say, when am I going to tell them? Whenever. Father in heaven, how grateful we are that you love us. How grateful we are that you've given us this message that is so much better than any other message this world could offer. It's Christ crucified because of us. We're guilty and for us so that through him taking on guilt, he can remove guilt forever and give us eternal life. He is risen. And we gather as often as we can with each new day. As the sun comes up, we're reminded there is a sun who is risen. There is a sun who's coming again. And it's my prayer that everyone within the sound of my voice believes. It's my prayer that everyone within the sound of my voice is on this side of the truth. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.